Well, good morning, FFM. Good morning. Man, what a beautiful day to be gathered together. And, you know, I, I ask myself as Easter approaches every year, if there'll ever be an Easter that I don't just break down in tears. Just to give you guys some contrast, back in 2009, my idea of celebrating Easter was to gather all my friends together at my house and cook a bunch of meth and hand out bags and, and hide bags in my woods and look for the bags in the woods. And little did I know that Easter Sunday was actually the day that my Savior rose and conquered the grave for me. And I'm a little bit extra emotional this Easter because back then people used to come from all different counties to gather at my house. And today I see people from Lawton. I see old, old friends that have been set free from drugs. I see people that have been resurrected from divorces and brokenness and pornography. All gathered here together, not to see me, but to see the Jesus in me. And so I'm honored that some of these men and some of these people would drive from so far away, Niles, to see what the Lord has done. Yeah. That the Lord would use someone like me that used to destroy every community that I stepped into. That used to destroy the community so much that my mom couldn't even work in that community because every house that she visited, she would see residues of the drugs and, and my name would get brought up. So I'm truly honored here today. I'm also honored that the pastor would trust me to speak to his congregation. That's a heavy trust. <laughs> so keep me in prayers. All right. So just as we get started, when we sing, we make a declaration. And I just, I really want to make a declaration because my life used to be all about seeing me. I want to make a declaration that we see the Lord today. So if you know this with me, just sing this one little chorus. It just goes like this. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up. Shining with the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love. As we sing, holy, 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 I want to see you. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we begin to enter into the word, Lord, I pray that we see you today, Lord. Lord God, I pray, Lord, that when people hear this word and, and people see me up on here just sharing your word, that they don't even see me, but they see the resurrection power of the Lord today. So God, shake this place with your thunder. Shake this place with your power today, Lord, because all we want to do is see you. This isn't a social club. This isn't a gathering because we all have the same hobbies and ideas. But Lord God, this is a gathering because we have one thing in common, and that is that you set us free. So show up in this place today, Lord, and do what only you can do. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to be in John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. And I'm just going to begin reading. Now the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early. It's very early this morning. While it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to him, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. I just got to pause there because if anyone's ever writing a book about me, I don't want to be known for the kind of car I drive or the house I live in. I want to be known for the man that outran everybody to get to Jesus. Come on. So he outran Peter, and he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb, and he saw the linen clothes lying there. And the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded together in a place by itself. 
Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked in the tomb and saw two angels sitting, one at the head and one at the other, the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? I feel like the Lord's going to ask that question to some of us today. Why are we weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping and whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned to him and said, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Now, I like to start by just saying, you know, like it or not, if you have been touched by the hand of God and God has revealed himself to you, you are enlisted in a battle. Amen. Jesus said, those who are not for me are against me. And I want to illustrate this with a small point in my life. I was working at work and the guy working on the line next to me, the Lord clearly told me, go pray for him, go pray for him. And when I tried to approach him to pray for him, he had three uh, crosses tattooed on his neck. And I said, man, I see those crosses. Do you believe in Jesus? And he said, not anymore. And so that, just, that, that right there discouraged me. And so I let that conversation depart. And the Lord kept telling me, go pray for him. Go pray for him. Go pray for him. And then so the, the Lord's uh, burden to pray for this man got heavier and heavier and heavier. And I knew it was the Lord because the guy wasn't acting upset. The guy wasn't acting depressed. There was no uh, physical signs that led me to pray for him. It was just the Lord telling me. And so finally, I was getting in an argument with a coworker, and I was having a really bad day. And the Lord's like, you need to pray for this man. And I said, all right, Lord. Uh, When we, we, it was Thanksgiving. When we get back from our Thanksgiving break at work, I will pray for this man. Well, we got back from Thanksgiving break. And this man that the Lord wanted me to pray for wasn't there. And word got around, and you know how people talk, and they came and told me, hey, remember that guy on Sea line They had no idea that I'd been wanting to pray for him. They said, uh, over Thanksgiving break, he committed suicide. And you know, I'm not meant to carry away the condemnation for not praying with that man. And to be honest, like we'll never know if me praying for that man would have made a difference. But all I know is my inactiveness to obey God was working for the devil. It worked for the forces of darkness because I could have brought a bit of light into that man's life, but because I was uncomfortable, I didn't. So again, I want to say whether you like it or not, you are enlisted in a battle. And this is, this is church, this isn't always a time to just play games, but this is literally life and death hanging in the balance. You never know what the person sitting next to you is going through. You never know what the marriage sitting next to you is going through. You never know what these kids are dealing with at school. And so I want to encourage you to be active in the kingdom. So during the first days of July in 1863, the Battle of Gettysburg raged. And just like most battles, this battle was all over slavery. Come on, some of the biggest battles in the world were fought over slavery. And as we talk about that, I want to talk about why Gettysburg. You see, Robert E. Lee, who was fighting for slavery, thought that winning a battle on the enemy's turf would impact the morale and the support for continuing the war. And I want to tell you guys today, the devil isn't after your stuff. Come on, when you see the car breaking down and you see the bills piling up, I'm telling you, it's not about your car or your career or anything. The devil is after more than just your stuff. Come on. If we as men go to work and we can get stressed out at work and we can get stressed out about the car breaking down and then we come home and we talk to our wives with a negative body tone or we talk to our kids with irritation in our voice, that's what the devil's after because that will put division in the family. I don't want to encourage you today, if you're experiencing a fight, to get your prayer closet, get into the secret place, and say, Lord, I know this isn't about my car. What is it really about? 
What is the battle really about? The second reason that they were fighting at Gettysburg is because of the road system. There was a lot of roads coming in and out of Gettysburg, and there was hundreds of thousands of troops being brought in. So it was really easy to bring them to that place. And I want to just petition you today, what kind of roads do you have that the enemy can use to attack you? What kind of roads to your mind? What kind of movies are we watching when we're, we're struggling with pornography and, and we're watching these movies with these terrible scenes in them? Is that a road that the devil can use? I feel like this Easter morning as we're talking about battles and we're going to talk about the greatest victory ever won, that we need to put up some road close signs. Come on, we need to put up some road close signs, whether it's family drama, whether it's the wrong kind of friends, whether it's the wrong kind of movies, whether it's music glorifying alcohol and, and flirting with all these women. Come on, if that is a road for the enemy to use, we need to say our family comes first, our God comes first. It's time to put up some road close signs. The devil will not have my family. And I just want to quote a famous pastor. He always says, uh, I, I will fight for my family, I will fight for my God and kill anything else that gets in the way or something like that, you know. <laughs> Come on. So, the first day of that battle, 15,500 were killed, captured, or missing. The second day was even bigger, 20,000. You see, as the battle went on, it wasn't the biggest battle, but it was definitely the costliest. And each day it got more costly. So I want to tell you guys today, what battles are you fighting that are so costly? Right. What battles are we fighting with our prodigal son and, and daughter? Like, are we fighting with them over small battles that are costing us the relationship? What about our husbands and wives? Are we fighting having a battle over the, the laundry being on the floor, but it's costing us the intimacy? What battles are we fighting that are costing us? What little things are getting in the way? And the longer the, battle, the longer the battle went on, the more costly it got. And I just felt like a uh, uh, stirring in my soul this Easter Sunday to tell you to embrace the resurrection power of Jesus Christ because these little battles are going to keep costing us. We got to put God first. We got to forgive. And we got to lay down our lives for our families. Come on. What little battles. And I want to talk about, we see different levels of effects. <clears throat> See, the Battle of Gettysburg affected hundreds of thousands of people. And so, you know, if you have a family member connected to that, you might celebrate or you might hear about it. But a lot of you, as I say Gettysburg, you might not realize, like, it might, oh, I might have heard about Gettysburg in high school. But the, the whole Civil War affected more people. And so we have a day once a year called Memorial Day that we get to celebrate that. Millions of people were affected from the whole Civil War. And we celebrate it. And then we go up to a bigger battle, the 4th of July or the Independence Day. Billions of people were affected. Democracy as we know it, the luxuries and freedoms we have, all of that we can see stem from the battle of Independence Day. And on, on the 4th of July, because it's a bigger victory, it is one of the loudest celebrated holidays in the world. With $2.7 billion spent on fireworks, $1.4 billion expected to be spent on alcohol every year. And I would just like to uh, just tell you guys that without ever reading a history book or without ever even going to school, you could walk around on the 4th of July and see the fireworks going off and see people stumbling around drunk. And without even reading about it, you would know that something great happened that day. It, you would be foolish to walk around on the 4th of July and say, man, there was never really a battle for Independence Day. Come on. Oh, and I want to tell you that 2,000 years ago on Easter morning, there was even a bigger battle wage. And because it was so long ago, some people in this world like to call it a myth or a legend. But just like you would never walk around on the 4th of July and say a battle never happened, come on, you would never walk around this great country on the Easter Sunday and say a battle didn't happen. 
Come on, you can drive around all over America and even fly around the world if you wanted to on any given Sunday and find millions of people lifting their hands, celebrating the battle over death, hell, and the grave. So if you're in here today and you can testify that Jesus still does miracles and that he still sets people free and that he really is still alive and well, can you clap your hands and let this world know that the resurrection power of Jesus Christ is still working today? Come on. I'm talking about that marriage that never should have continued. I'm talking about the cancer that should have killed you. I'm talking about that addiction that should have buried half of us in this room. I'm talking about anxiety that plagued your mind. I'm talking about depression that never should have ended. I'm talking about these things that were defeated on Easter Sunday. Can we praise the Lord for victory? Come on. And I just want to petition the Church of America. We need to quit letting the world celebrate their sin more than we celebrate our families. We need to quit letting the world celebrate the clubs getting all crazy more than we celebrate a guy who rose from the dead and still touches drug addicts today, still touches families today. Come on. And just like our celebrations get bigger, This should be the biggest celebration of all time. Come on. So we celebrate today. But it wasn't always that way. We were trying to get up this morning and my wife said, man, didn't Jesus rise? I don't have to, you know? (laughs) She said, oh, this is early. I'm like, all right, (laughs) But on Easter morning 2,000 years ago, it was very different. They rose thinking their hopes and dreams had been killed. They rose with the memory of the man they loved, the man they walked with still hanging on that cross, bleeding from all points of his body. And verse, scripture number nine says, yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. They didn't know. I've read the Bible a few times. He told them. He told them lots of times. He told them many ways. He told them metaphorically. He told them point blank. But here it says they did not know that he must rise from the dead. The Greek word for that is ido. I can't really say, I'm not David Campbell. I can't, you know, but it's, it's a Greek word meaning properly to see with physical, metaphorical sense. Perceiving mentally. And it's like akin to, I see what you're saying. It's a deeper understanding. So they knew, but they didn't know. They're all standing, looking at an empty tomb, confused. You see, they had thought Rome was going to be overturned. They were under Roman oppression. Taxes were getting higher. They were getting just drained for everything they have. They didn't have all their religious freedoms. And their whole lives, they had been... From the book of Genesis to the New Testament, they had been established as a nation. They turned away from God, got brought into captivity. The Lord saved them, brought them back, established them as a nation again. And then it would happen back and forth. So here they are under the Roman oppression again, thinking, man, I want to be a nation again. I want to be a nation. Come on. And they're looking around, and, and they get prophesied about this king And then they see their king die. And they're just staring at that empty tomb. Where have you taken the body? What are you doing, Lord? Have you ever had a what are you doing, Lord kind of moment? They wanted to be a nation, but then their king died because they didn't know what he was going to do. Have you ever received a promise from God about your marriage? But every day there is tension And instead of coming right home, maybe you drive around in circles, procrastinating, walking through the door with a knot in your stomach. And you're looking up at God. God, what are you doing? Have you ever been told you've been reunited with your kids, but every court battle is looking worse and worse and worse for you? And you're saying, Lord, I'm following you. Lord, I'm getting right. God, what are you doing? Have you ever been promised by God that you would have a child and that you would finally get pregnant, but it ends in a miscarriage and you've already named the baby and you've already read them bedtime stories and and you're looking up at God, God, what are you doing? What are you doing? 
Come on, have you ever had a child when they were young and they would be up here ra- waving the flags and people prophesied over them and prayed over them and God promised you that they'd be following the Lord and now they're 25 years old and you don't know where they're at and every time you can't get a hold of them, you're calling all the hospitals, checking mobile patrol to see if they're back in jail and you're looking up at God, crying out for your prodigal child, saying, God, what are you doing? What are you doing, God? Amen. That was the picture of this Easter morning. Has ever God ever given you a promise about your finances? You're tithing every penny. You're giving every time there's an Easter offering. Every time you start, try to start a business, it doesn't work. You're trying to break the generational poverty curses over your lives so your kids never have to work the way you do. And taxes are getting more. Gas is getting more expensive. And, and groceries are getting more expensive. And you're like, Lord, you promised you would open up the windows of heaven. I've tithed every penny. I've given every offering. God, what are you doing? What are you doing? I want to get personal about my empty tomb experience. The day I got married, my daughter was prophesied to me. Now, my ex-wife was on birth control, and we were not trying to have a kid, but the man who prophesied it, if he said it, you better put your money on it. This guy, I'm telling you, I've seen him prophesy cancer would get healed, and it was gone. Like, if he said it, it happened. So he said, you're going to have a kid within a year. And I was like, oh. And sure enough, within a year, I had my daughter, Lila. Come on. I, and I remember the day that God called my name in that prison cell and he told me there was more to life. And I was like, I don't know. God showed me there was more to life. He showed me with my family. He showed me with my daughter. And I just remember holding her. And, you know, I, I did the whole thing. And they make fun of it at movies. But I had my shirt off and I, I was just holding her. You know, that skin to skin, that bonding or whatever. And I just, I was like, Lord, this is it. And so I had this baby and I was sold out. I was telling every drug addict that the Lord had risen. I was telling everybody, like, Jesus is real. And then out of the blue, destruction came. And there was a lot that happened, but I came home one day. And that baby that God had promised me wasn't in my house. My wife, ex-wife had left and the baby was gone. And I was sitting there, sitting in my dining room chair, staring at the floor, just remembering the time I used to hear little feet running around the house. And I was saying, God, what are you doing? I remember the times that I would come home and she would sprint to meet me at the door after a long day of work. And now I was coming home and the house was empty. God, what are you doing? What are you doing? How could the infinite, almighty God call my name in a prison cell, set me free, take me from the drugs, take me from the dealing, and then I come home and everything that I thought God was doing was gone. God, what are you doing? I gave everything to this. I gave everything to that family. I gave everything to walking with God. I wasn't holding back at all. And I came home and I was like, God, what are you doing? Just like they did on that Easter morning. Mary was sitting at the tomb crying, but now that I've lived and now that I've been through some experiences, I understand a lot deeper. They weren't just sad because they lost a friend. They weren't just sad because they lost somebody they loved. They lost their identity. Their identity was in being a nation. Come on. Their identity was in being a nation. And so when they seen Jesus die, they saw their identity die. When my ex-wife left and I came home and I didn't know where my daughter was and I didn't know where she was, my identity died. You see, when I got out of prison, I chased being a husband and a father more than I chased being a son of God. And if you're in here today and you're looking at your life and it's a little bit messy, I'm here to tell you that God wants to do something more than what you think he's doing. He wants to make you a child of God. He wants the kingdom of heaven to come. He said, let my kingdom come, my will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He's doing something bigger than what you think. Come on, maybe your business failed, maybe you got laid off of work, maybe you had a miscarriage, but you got to keep on going. Maybe you lost a sibling or a parent or a child or a grandchild, but I'm here to tell you, you are more than a mother, you are more than a father, you're more than a brother or a sister. You are a son or a daughter of God, and that thing you lost wasn't the end. Look at your neighbor and say, the tomb is empty, but it's not the end. Your missed goals are not the end. Your failed marriage is not the end. Your relapse is not the end. Come on. When the disciples came to the tomb, they were expecting to find a dead Jesus. I just want to prophesy to this crowd today. 
When you go back to see that dead thing in your life or that mess in your life, expect the unexpected. Come on. I want to prophesy to some people in this place, expect the unexpected. I serve a God of the unexpected. When God tells Sarah she's going to have a child, but she is past childbearing bearing age, expect the unexpected. When Moses tells Pharaoh to let my people go, but they stand between a sea and an army with death on both sides, expect the unexpected. When giant Goliath is threatening you and everything you love, and all you are is a little shepherd boy with a sling and a rock, you better expect the unexpected this morning. Oh, come on. When you want to build a church in Centerville with a population of 1,200 and everybody tells you it's not going to work, look around you. Expect the unexpected this morning. Come on. Is anybody in here hearing me today? Some call him Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Some call him Jehovah Rapha, my healer. I call him Jehovah Sneaky because he always does the unexpected. Come on, somebody. Woo. Easter morning is a reminder to expect the unexpected. If the worship team can come up, I'm about to wrap up. I can't talk about a risen Savior without talking about his people. This goes beyond just you or me, my four and no more, my my immediate family. This goes way beyond that. In verse 17... Jesus told Mary, go to my brethren and tell them. And in verse 18, Mary tells the disciples, I have seen the Lord. Simple. There was no theological debate. There wasn't a bunch of scriptures and epistles brought up. And there was no doctrinal and and the Pentateuch and Leviticus brought up. It was simple. Simple. Without having a college degree, you can leave this place this morning and tell someone that's lost, I have seen the Lord. Come on. It makes me think of Moses when he came to the Israelites. He didn't show up with the Ten Commandments at first. He showed up with demonstration and power, and he said, let my people go. We got to show up with simplicity. I have seen the Lord. I have seen the Lord. We overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. If you have a testimony in this place, it's right up there with the blood of the lamb. Come on. It's the blood and your testimony that's going to set this broken world free. It's the blood and the testimony that's going to change this world. So if you're staring at an empty tomb today, you might not understand what God is doing But I stand on the other side of my empty tomb and I can testify and declare to every dead dead situation in your life today that tells you you're not going to make it. Every voice that tells you God's promise and plan isn't going to come through in your life. I stand here now with a wife and that isn't an Ishmael. I stand here with my daughter, half custody. I stand here with a home and I'm not homeless anymore. Come on. Me and my wife stand today in this church house today, over three years sober from crystal meth. Come on. I might not be able to look at you and tell you exactly what God is going to do in your marriage or exactly what God is going to do in your life, but I can tell you this. It's going to be exceedingly, abundantly, above all you can think or ask or imagine. Come on. Come on. So as we stand to our feet, I want every person that's staring at an empty tomb with their prodigal son or staring at an empty tomb in their marriage or staring at an empty tomb in their finances or whatever it is, I want you guys to come down to this altar and we will pray for your empty tomb. We will pray for that miracle. We will pray for that breakthrough. And I'm here to tell you today, it's going to be better than just being a nation. God wants to make people sons or daughters in this place today. Not just so we can have church, but we, so we can walk outside of those doors and say, thus saith the Lord, be free. Come on. There are 19 million kids living without a father. We need to tell them that the Lord is risen. 437,283 kids were removed by CPS from their parents last year. We need to do more than have church. We need to tell them that the Lord is risen. Around 27.2 million Americans battling with drug addiction, lost with kids in CPS. We serve a God that rose from the dead. We need to tell him that the Lord is risen.